Greetings fellow book lovers and welcome back to Colin's Corner. Today we are going to be doing a spoiler filled review, so the whole video will be spoiler of House of Chains, which is the fourth book in the Malazan Book of the Fallen by Steven Erickson. And if you are familiar with my channel, if you guys been here for a while, you know that normally what I do is go over the answer for the last Comedy with Colin segment where I go over the answer of a joke that I gave you in my last video. But I'm going to uh, forego that for today since this is a review of the fourth book of a series and I feel like there will be a very limited audience uh, for this. So anyways, we're going to skip the comedy with Colin and we're going to get straight into the review. But first, I would like to take a moment to just recognize how incredible the Malazan community is in terms of the amount of time and effort that fans of this series put into making information readily available for other fans. I regularly use resources from the 10 Very Big Books podcast, like I listen to their podcast and I also use their Google Docs. Uh, so I want to shout them out. Um, also, Jeff and Lana from the DLC Book Club, they have been doing an ongoing series. I'm sure you guys, if you're fans of Malaz and know about them, but uh, they read chunks of the book and then they go through and they they talk about their thoughts and, and um, what they think is going to happen, what has happened. And I would just want them to know that I follow along with all of their videos. I love them laughing, crying, and, and just experiencing this series with them as I work my way through it. So I owe a lot of my enjoyment and knowledge of the series um, to them. I want to also mention, and these are just, there's so many, but these are just many of the resources that I use. I want to shout out Dr. Philip Chase and A.P. Canavan from The Best of Fantasy and A Critical Dragon, their, their respective channels, for providing a more academic view of the Malazan series. Um, and lastly, I want to give a shout out to Jimmy from the Fantasy Network who introduced me to Malazan and is in large part the reason that I'm reading the series. Uh, I think I said lastly for Jimmy, but I do not want to leave out the amazing people that comment on my videos from Elasm Reviews and join our live streams for the read-along group that's been doing a live stream spoiler discussions. You guys are all amazing and make, make this experience just that much better. So I just wanted to take a minute at the beginning of this video to extend a thank you and say that I wouldn't be able to provide the reviews that I put out that I'm proud of uh, without the help of all of these resources. And I also want to make it known that I don't glean all of this knowledge from my own read through. I, I do seek out lots of resources and help and I love doing that. Um, but I feel like uh, these people deserve a shout out. So I wanted to start the video with that. Finally, let's get to the review. So this book has taken me a while to process and by a while, I mean a little over a week and has required a lot of help from the above mentioned resources. And there was a lot of lore developed in this book, a lot of history revealed and and a deepening of the understanding of the relationships between different people and different peoples in this book and in this world. And uh, I'm not going to pretend that I understand everything. And uh, I definitely don't understand everything. But I think I'm gaining a better understanding of the workings of this world. And um, I'm still confused in a lot of places. So if I get anything wrong today or if I uh, stumble or mispronounce or just get flat out get something wrong please don't be afraid to let me know in the comments because that helps me make sense of this world as well i just want to note that uh i'm going to skip a ton of stuff i can't talk about everything that i want to talk about in this book so what i did to structure this review is uh, i i pulled out some characters that i wanted to talk about that i really enjoyed reading and some themes that i really enjoyed reading and kind of that tied into the characters that I'm talking about and just in general. So uh, just a disclaimer, I'm going to leave a ton of characters out. I'm going to leave a ton of plot lines out. I'm going to leave a ton of stuff out and probably get some stuff wrong. So with that disclaimer, let's move on to some of the characters that I loved reading about in House of Chains. The first we're going to get out of the way because it's the obvious one and it is going to be Karsa Orlong. Uh, an extremely well-realized character who we get introduced to in a unique way from Malazan, I will say. Uh, he's one POV. So 
we get in the first three books tons of very wide angled views of the world tons of different character perspectives tons of different views from different sides of the battles of the people that we're following and the first four chapters 200 pages novel length ish of this book we are just following Carson Orlong and um, it's a bit jarring because we don't know <laughs> initially that we know him already but in my mind we're reading a completely new character and solely following him so that was uh, a bit of a just different experience that i really really liked now carsa is horrible i mean he he, he is a he's committing almost immediately some absolutely atrocious acts i mean we're talking about you know, rapes and, and, and killing people and uh, just seeking power and vengeance. And um, he seems to, I don't know if I want to say lack morals, but he seems to just have different cultural morals and values that are very abrasive to what at least I was raised in, um, in the Western part of the world, and what many people in today uh, would not consider normal cultural types of practices so Carsa is a hard character for me to really think about and I love that Steven Erickson challenges us with these characters and there will be other ones of these that I talk about today in this review as well initially it seems to me that his kind of guardrails his guides his moral guides uh, if you will are his friends Bayroth and Dellum and uh, they kind of, try, well, at least Bayroth, I believe, is the one that tries to kind of nudge him in the right direction with things and uh, give him advice that Carsa doesn't normally take and sometimes later re recollects and, you know, uh, in retrospect kind of thinks, you know, oh, Bayroth was maybe onto something. Anyways, they kind of serve as the moral guidelines, so we're not just completely thrown into this world where, you know, we're just watching Carsa wreak havoc. Um, in these initial villages and stuff that he he's traveling to and uh, Carsa to me was a representation of somebody who is sheltered extremely sheltered in his tribal Upbringing and then just goes out into the world to realize it isn't exactly How he saw it how he believed the world to be or how it was told to him that it was and It's important to remember that Carsa in Teblor time is young he's I, I mean i don't know what technically he would be considered if you were to compare it but my guess he's he's like an adolescent like a teenager that just kind of thinks he knows everything and uh kind of uses brute force and just willpower to get through obstacles and parts of this world that we see him getting through and i'm not justifying cars's actions because what he does they're horrible. The The things that we are seeing Carson do are horrible, but he does grow a great deal from the beginning of this book to where his character ends up uh, at the end of this book, which I don't think obviously is the end of his character arc, but it's the end of his character arc uh, in this book. And in many ways, it's perhaps just the beginning of who Carson will grow to be in this series. Uh, he learns from experiences he learns from Bayroth and Dellum. He learns from Torvald Nam. Um, and he learns because he utilizes in his own Carcel way uh, critical thinking. And that's kind of how he realizes many of the things that he believes about the world are actually not true or not entirely true. He was a fascinating character to me in the same and i'm going to make a comparison here to those realm of the elderlings fans uh he was a comparison to me character wise in terms of how he made me feel reading him to captain kennett where um, i'm not saying that they're the same character by any means but what i'm saying is that there are parallels uh for me basically uh carsa and, and captain kennett had me very very conflicted because at face value, they both are committing just atrocity, horrible acts, uh, repeatedly. But 
also do good in the world around them and in large part the way that they act is not just simply their decision it's it's a part of uh, traumatic events that have happened to them or just their upbringing in their culture and the way that they were raised so it makes it difficult to just say and write off Karsa as a bad character because uh, many of the things that he is using many of the the the, the tactics and the things that he believes are cultural beliefs for him. So, I don't know, he's a very interesting character to read. And by the end of it, I would say, you know, in many situations, I was really pulling for him, but still trying to remember, like, this dude is killing a lot of people and doing horrible things to women um, throughout the course of this book. So, it's a very interesting character study. Next up, I want to talk about a duo of characters, of a famous, allegedly, duo of characters in the Malazan series in its entirety, which would be Onrak the Broken and Troll Sangar. Now, these two formed uh, one of the most unexpected but entertaining relationships in the book for me. Uh, they basically became friends because of similar situations. They were both shorn from their people and their clans. Uh, Troll was a Tistidor, 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 I don't know, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. He was a Tistidor um, that was shorn from his people, and, and Onrak was obviously, we find out, uh, a large part of the reason that this part of the world is in such disarray in this book. And, um, you know, due to his frowned upon graffiti practices. So, these two and their kind of budding friendship um, in this novel, we learn a lot of lore through them. We learn a lot of history about how this this Malazan world came to be what it is, why certain groups are against each other, why certain peoples are against each other, why there's alliances, and why there are enemies. And they are very long-standing, many of them, and for a lot of them, they stem from a place where there's good reason to be allied or enemies with another group. And I liked learning about lore in this world through the lens of these two characters. Um, their dialogue I found to be enjoyable to read and funny at times. Erickson has a way of just kind of inserting these little pieces of humor where we need them the most and from the characters that we need to hear them the most from in certain situations. And I saw a lot of that with Onrak and Troll over the course of this book. And I'm not saying that I, again, understand a lot of why this stuff is or who exactly all these different peoples are, these races, um, but I feel like I have a better understanding of it, albeit I'm still confused. And it's in large part due to these two characters. Uh, regardless, I really enjoyed learning about this world through them, and, and we see the the Talon I Mass and the Tisti Edor kind of set aside differences as peoples in this book in order to further a common or at least somewhat common goal, um, and it seems to lead to uh, development of a deeper respect between these two different types of people or whatever you want to call them, beings. Next up, I want to talk about um, Adjunct Tavare or Tavor. I think the audiobook pronounce, pronounces it Tavare, so if I say Tavare, that's why um, a lot of people say Tavor. Regardless, I already gave you guys a disclaimer. I'm probably going to get a lot of stuff wrong. That's okay. This is the first book where we get a significant amount of page time, not through Tavor's point of view, but just of Tavor. And uh, we as the reader get to know her a lot better, I think. Tavor is, to me, an extremely complicated character. Uh, again, like so many are in this series, on the surface she seems completely like narcissistic, cold, uh, this, this, she's this this cold decision-making machine that was not built to take the emotions of others into consideration. Um, and in many ways, an aspect of these traits are necessary for her to be successful as basically the second most powerful person in the Malazan Empire as the adjunct. 
uh, I mean, she accepts the position as the adjunct, and you know, in previous books, she she renounces ties to her house, Perrin, uh, and in, a, in an effort to prove loyalty to Lucine, she even has her parents arrested during the call of nobility in Unta, uh, all the way back in Dead House Gates. And to me, there's a lot more that I had to consider with Tavor. Uh, for instance, instead of allowing her younger sister, Felicin, uh, to basically get murdered because she's a noble and that's what they were doing to these children that weren't old enough to be married, is, is just killing them, uh, she had to make the unthinkable decision of sending Felicin to the Odotero mines to basically do slave labor in absolutely abhorrent conditions where she knew she, i mean tavor had to have known how bad the conditions in these mines were and what, what went on especially with young girls young attractive girls in these mines and she made the decision to send fellas into the mines in order to save her life in the hopes that she would be able to reconvene and maybe not set aside this and pretend everything's okay but keep her sister alive it had to have been an incredibly difficult decision to make and uh, you know before we really get to know tavor we just kind of see her as this cold-blooded like business only making decisions to further the empire and in this book in house of change we finally see at least through gamut's point of view I don't know if you want to call them chinks in her armor, but we get to see her as a person. And we, we do see instances where these these decisions that she's having to make, they do weigh on her and they do affect her, uh, even though she doesn't always show it physically. And then when she sends Felicin, uh, she always sends, sends Felicin with the protection of Bowden, who isn't just any Joe Schmo, he's an incredibly lethal uh, Talon, right? He's a Talon, not a Claw. He's a Talon. And so she she's showing us as the reader uh, are getting shown that she does care about Felicin and she doesn't want Felicin to die. Even though many other people in the book, including Felicin, don't understand why Tavor is doing the things that she's doing. Then, on top of all this, she's thrust into commanding an army against a rebellion and has to kind of spitball her way through building out this army without ever having the first-hand experience um, of doing so. We know, I mean, we learn in this book that she she is kind of a history nut and loves to study armies and, and famous battles from, you know, battles past and in, in the earlier parts of the Empire. And, um... But now she she has to do it herself, and no matter how much studying you do on any of this type of stuff, uh, there's got to be a huge learning curve. And um, she kind of handles it by not allowing any discussion, not allowing any uh, any kind of feedback from her highest in command. She she kind of waltzes in, she makes decisions, um, and she does this, I think, in a in a way to not show any weakness and not show that she may be not quite sure of herself. And she also has to prove herself uh, to these battle-hardened veterans that she's kind of inherited the command of. I mean, these are people that she's now commanding that have seen, that have been through battles, that have been through um, a lot of different types of uh, kind of fighting and war and and she has to prove that she's worthy of commanding them and that's that's a very very tall task and you know at times we forget that Tavor is not as young as Felicin but she's pretty young as well so meanwhile this entire time we also know that she is not only like did she try to save Felicin's life she's actively trying to enlist the help of Lestera Yil and Pearl to go and find Felicin so we see that she really does care about um, her sister. She cares about Perrin, too. Uh, Ganos Perrin, that is. And um, I don't know, we just kind of see this this humanization of Tavor, and she's not this just this 
business-like robot making decisions. We we get to see Tavor at least you know, small shades of Tavor as a person in this book. Lastly, for characters that I want to talk about today, um, I want to talk about Felicin, who I feel like gets a bad rap sometimes. So for much of this book, we aren't actually dealing with Felicin. We are dealing with a vengeful spirit, the whirlwind goddess, uh, embodying Felicin. And this version of Felicin, I think, can be really frustrating to deal with, uh, which to me may be why the, she gets a bad rep sometimes. I'm not sure, but I've talked to a lot of people that get really annoyed with Felicin, and I think, um, you know, in this book, um, that might be why. But also, uh, can you imagine going through everything that Felicin has gone through at the ages of like 14, 15, 16, however old. I think she's 14 when she gets sent to the Odotero Mines um, in Deadhouse Gate, so she can't be that much older when she is then embodied by this vengeful whirlwind goddess spirit. On top of all this, she's, she, I mean, she's, she's extremely young and she has no idea why she's being treated this way. She doesn't know that Tavor hasn't put together, I mean, we saw that Perrin in his more mature mind and experience put together that, oh, Tavor had to make a terrible decision to send Felicin to the mines, but she probably did it with protection, and she probably did it to save Felicin. Felicin is just like furious. She has no idea why she's getting, why she's getting what she thinks, and it is the short end of the stick. And on top of that, she. This is much deeper. Um, this this goes back all the way to her younger childhood, where she doesn't, she's never felt accepted and loved by Tavor. So she thinks that Tavor. She thinks that this is an extension of that. So she is not thinking clearly, and she is in this this vengeful, wants to get back at Tavor mindset, angry, rightly so, for all almost all of Deadhouse Gates and definitely throughout the entirety of this book. And I think this is my opinion. I don't know if this is ever stated in the book or not, it might be, but I think that the whirlwind goddess, the spirit of the whirlwind goddess, whatever happened to make her Shaik and take her over, take Felicin over, um, I think that they, this this entity recognized that resentment that Felicin had festering for Tavor and, and immediately flipped it to use for the spirit's benefit, to use against Tavor. I mean, the whirlwind goddess, we find out, is basically driven mad by Onrak's betrayal of her and and it's pretty much just unhinged and then you know she overtakes this this body of Felicin who is also maybe a bit unhinged and kind of immature and angry um so it's just uh it's it's I don't know it's uh no pun intended it's the perfect storm for what the ensuing events end up being now, if Tavor is still learning to be a commander, uh, then Felsen is in even worse shape because she's trying to command not only an army, but a rebellion. Uh, so she doesn't have the benefit of inheriting a like a established military system or... Uh, like, Tavor was basically handed an army that is, you know, battle-tested. They've been through it. They have, you know, hard-won experience. Felsen's trying to throw together a ragtag kind of just conglomerate of rebellious people against the Empire. So she's got an even harder time, and it, it shows because she's got disarray throughout her entire camp, and, um, you know, it ends up becoming that all of her, you know, high mages and her people in command are backstabbing, and it's a lot for her to try to deal with, even with the help that she has from Haboric and other people in her corner. In so many ways, it's completely unfair where Felicin's character has ended up. Uh, then we get to the absolutely tragic ending of this character, uh, where right at the worst possible moment, and kind of as a result of the infighting in her, you know, in her rebellion army, uh, Corbello Dom's dog slayers kill or his high mages that he has hired. I forget who exactly did it, but 
they kill the world. They find the whirlwind goddess's body and they kill her. And this happens to be the exact moment that Felicin walks up to Tavor in the basin with all the gear on. And then the, the, the body, the embodiment, the spirit leaves her and she's just Felicin again. All of a sudden she's just Felicin again. And then immediately she gets stabbed by Tavor. And the last thing we, we you know, we, we see through her dialogue is, oh my God, all I ever wanted to know was why you don't love me. Why did you never love me? Why was I never good enough? It's, tra it's absolutely a tragic ending. And on top of all that, Tavor has no idea that she just killed Felicin, who she's actively looking for. It's crazy. I couldn't believe how this ended, how tragic it was. Uh, and like, it's just, Erickson, I don't know how you do it, but it was just not the way I thought this book was going to end. Um, the first three books are just the craziness. They're massive. They are such huge scopes, huge battles, things happening everywhere. And this ends up coming down to, to basically two sisters, um, fighting against each other and, and one not even realizing that they're fighting their sister. It was just, it was beautifully done. I could never have pictured how this was going to end. And, um, it was beautifully, beautifully tragic. So that's all the characters that I'm going to talk about today because I don't want this video to be two hours. But before we wrap things up, I do want to talk about some themes that I noticed in this book that stuck out to me. And the first of those is going to be kind of this theme of, uh, acceptance there's a lot of people just accepting things as they are accepting their duties rather maybe is a better way to say that uh the malzan military is a great example of this where you know we get soldiers and even commanders accepting what is told of them because it's coming from somewhere higher up and they don't often question it at least don't question it outright in front of everybody but you know in their um squads maybe they'll talk you know gossip about things but um, it's not just the military, there's tons of characters that just kind of accept that things need to get done and they need to do them, and that's just the way that things are. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, with Tavor and Felicin, we see that, we kind of see that with Karsa, um, accepting that he's not going to accept the way that he thought things were. I don't know, Karsa is a bit of an interesting one. Um, but I thought acceptance was a theme that I saw throughout this in a few different ways. The next thing that I want to talk about is coming of age. There's multiple examples of this as well. And hear me out. Uh, we see Tavor grow a lot um, as she learns how to build this army and command a cohesive army. Um, we see Karsa essentially growing up in a weird way because, like I mentioned, He's considered a young Teblor, uh, and he's going out into the world, and he's 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 doing he's making mistakes, he's learning from them a little bit, uh, he's gaining experiences by seeing people from different cultures and interacting with people around him in the world, and it's giving him different worldviews, which are shaping the decisions that he makes in the future, and you know he even shows mercy at the end of the book, which I never thought you know I would see coming, where he, where he. Uh, throws i forget her name right now it starts with an s but he throws the head into the water because it will allow her to get released and just kind of be free into oblivion and not suffer anymore um we see crocus uh, or cutter and absolar grow because they're very young and uh kind of in this weird love flirty thing but they're growing and they're trying to figure out the world around them too um so i think we see at least I saw what stuck out to me was a lot of different areas, a lot of different characters where we see this coming of age theme in this book, which I thought was a bit different compared to the first three that I read. And lastly, I definitely need to talk about the biggest probably through line theme of this entire series so far, which is compassion. Um, you know, it, it, the compassion shown between between uh, Troll Sengar and Onrak, the incredible compassion uh, and mercy shown by Lestar Yil and, and Pearl when they realize in the moment that Tavor just killed her sister, but Tavor can't know that because she'll unravel and it will be horrible for the Malazan army, so they keep this 
you know, they, 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 they tell her, you know, they found Felis and she's definitely dead, but they don't tell her how, like that's, it's terrible, but it's quick thinking and it's compassionate towards Tavor, who seems to now be earning the respect that she wanted and deserves uh, from her units. So compassion has, has been shown, obviously, in spades in Memories of Ice, and we've seen it in um, in Dead House Gates and Gardens of the Moon, too. So it seems like this is a theme that Erickson really likes to focus on and show throughout um, his world and I'm here for it. Again, there are many characters and plot lines and themes that I did not and could not discuss in this video, um, but the group that is doing this read along is going to be doing a live spoiler discussion of House of Chains and we're gonna have a ton to talk about. So when everybody in the group finishes and we decide on a date, to have this discussion, we will let you guys know that, so that you can come and join in the comments section while we kind of gush about what the heck just went on in this massive book four in the series. This is a long video and I knew it was going to be long, but uh, there was just so much that I needed to sort out in my mind and in many ways compiling review helps me to make sense of the book that I just read. So if you're still here, thank you so, so, so much for watching. I appreciate it. If you want to continue following me on my journey through the Malazan Book of the Fallen and many other books and series, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. If you liked today's video, don't forget to like it and share it so that more people can see it. I hope you guys are all enjoying what you're currently reading. And remember, you're always welcome in Colin's Corner.